Good morning. Thank you, Iggy. And hello, everyone at UX South Africa. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you for asking me to be part of this conference. I hope it's been an enjoyable couple of days for you already and that I'm going to get this uh, third day off to a, a really good start. As Iggy mentioned, my name is Leonie Watson, and I'd like to talk to you about why I think it's a good thing when things are made with love. Actually, I want to talk to you about accessibility. And so you might not unreasonably ask, what's love got to do with that? Uh, well, it's a great song by Tina Turner from back in the 80s. But actually, what has love got to do with accessibility? That's something I think I can answer. Accessibility doesn't happen by accident. It takes thought, it takes understanding, and I think it takes a little bit of love to do it really well because we all got into our profession because we like creating things, we like designing, building, forming interactions, implementing and producing things that people are going to use. And we want those experiences to be enjoyable, to be fit for purpose, to be appropriate, to be achievable. And I think to do that with pride, to a great deal of quality. Sometimes you just need to put a little bit of love into the exercise to make it really sparkle. So everybody needs somebody to love. So said the Blues Brothers back uh, in the very early 80s. And they were absolutely right. So much so I'm going to borrow from the lyrics of that song because what do they mean? Well, they meant you. It turns out that humans are extraordinarily unique and beautiful and diverse and capable and able and differently configured. And that's what makes us wonderful. It's also what makes us a little bit complicated to design and build for, but that's okay. We're in this for the challenge of doing exactly that. So look around you, look at the people you know, the people sitting next to you now, and Think about those people when you design, because there's a good chance that amongst the people near you now or the people you work with in your family, your friends, there are people who do have disabilities. They might not be obvious ones. They might not be permanent ones. They could be situational or temporary, but there will be people around you who will benefit from accessibility. Also, and I hate to bring you on a downer this early in the morning, think about your future selves. You might all currently be in the height of full bloom and youth and vigor and energy, but I'm sorry to say, as you get older, things are going to stop working quite so well as they used to. You might not see so well, you might not hear so well, your fingers might not move so easily to control a mouse or tap a key or, or a touch screen. You might not find it as easy to learn new things or remember the thing that you just learned. So age unfortunately, gets to us all sooner or later. So think about designing for yourselves now, but also think about designing for your future selves. Think about designing for me. Uh, I have a permanent disability. I'm blind. I can't see anything at all. But actually, don't think about designing for me. That's a terrible idea. You should never design for just one person, of course. But again, people with disabilities are all around us and often where you'd least expect them. Very famous people have disabilities. Kira Knightley, the actress, is dyslexic, so she may well find text reading difficult under certain circumstances. Stevie Wonder is an extraordinarily well-known musician who is blind, like me. If only I had half the musical talent as he did, I'd be a happy person and in a different profession. But uh, there is also Ellie Simmons, an Olympic athlete. She's a swimmer. Uh, who has a physical disability uh, and she's a, a multi gold silver medal winner in the Paralympic Games. And then going back a little further in time, Toulouse Lautrec, the well known artist and painter of his time in Paris, who also had a physical disability. And of course, it's not just famous people. As I mentioned before, people with disabilities, of permanent disabilities that don't go away, are all around you. There are lots of people out there who have different seeing, hearing, thinking or moving disabilities. And we should think about all of them because we all need somebody to love. But then we've got to think about them and everybody, the last bit, because we're really designing for the public quite often. 
And as I mentioned at the start, the public comes in lots of different forms. We have lots of different capabilities and abilities. We use technologies in lots of different ways. We might tap, we might talk to it, we might touch, we might type, we might point, we might click. Often we might yell at it too probably a different talk. But the point is, there are a lot of different people in your target audience, and we won't always have intelligence about the demographics. We might know what browser they're using or which mobile platform. We might know which region they're in or which language their device is set to. But quite often, we won't know if they're using a mouse as opposed to a keyboard. We won't know if they're using a touchscreen device with a keyboard, a touchscreen device with speech input, a laptop with speech input, a laptop with a screen reader, or any combination. And those things, of course, change. What I might use on my mobile phone <clears throat> may well be a different set of technologies to the ones I use on my laptop. So we've got to think about everybody when we're designing. And the best way we can do that is to follow good standards and good principles that help us capture the needs of as many of those people as we can. I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. Another good song, this time from Meatloaf, but it's a refrain we often hear about accessibility. I'll do anything for really great design, but I won't do accessibility. And the reasons we hear are, are pretty constant. I hear accessibility stops creativity. Well, let's stop and think about that for a minute. On screen, there's a picture of the Pont d'Arc Bridge in Paris. It's covered in tiny little padlocks hundreds, probably thousands of tiny little padlocks. The padlock, really, a very clear symbol of constraint, of limitation, of prevention, of stopping someone from doing something. But young people have traveled from all over to attach little padlocks to this ancient bridge as a sign of affection, as a message of love for the person that's important to them in their lives. And so they've taken a very symbol of prevention and stoppage and turned it into something that looks really quite remarkable. It's hugely creative and it's entirely built out of the notion of doing something with love. Ernest Hemingway gives us another good example. He took a bet several years ago now, of course, that he couldn't, in just six words, come up with a story that was as deeply thought-provoking, as emotionally resonant as the novels that he wrote. This is Ernest Hemingway, so he took the bet, and what he came up with was this. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. Stop and think about that. The story, the backstory of that is, you know, something really quite powerful. But I have to tell you, actually, it wasn't Ernest Hemingway who said anything of the sort. These and this particular short story predate him by two or three decades. But the point remains. A severe constraint was put in the front of someone, and under that constraint, they came up with something really quite astonishingly creative. So we know this happens. We know we have the phrase, necessity is the mother of invention. It's a well-known psychological edict that if we're placed under constraint, actually, we humans get really creative. Another example is Michelangelo and the statue of David. What you may not know, even if you're familiar with the statue, is that Michelangelo wasn't the person who originated it. It was actually a person called Agnestini de Medicio who started it 40 years before Michelangelo got his hands on it. He didn't finish it and it sat there unfinished for all those decades until Michelangelo was commissioned to finish the Statue of David. It was worse though. Not only did he get asked to take on a half-carved lump of rock and do something good with it, he was given tons of constraints. They told him the position David had to be in. Uh, the uh, orientation of his limbs, the way he was looking, even down to the qualities of his nose. It got worse. They also told him he had to complete the whole thing in two years. So under a considerable amount of both artistic and time constraint came one of the most beautiful, stunning, creative statues, possibly in all time. So again, creativity doesn't necessarily get killed off by constraint, quite the reverse. It's also worth remembering that design means different things to different people in different circumstances. It's not always about cosmetic and aesthetic beauty. Sometimes beauty and creativity come in the form of being fit for purpose. In 2011, the UK government decided to rip up its rulebook on digital government and create a single centralised platform that meant citizens could have the same user experience no matter which bit of UK government they were dealing with. 
and they created the GovUK platform. It's very simple, it's uncluttered, it has user-first design methodology, and it's highly accessible. And in 2013, it won a prestigious Design of the Year award. It beat 98 other entries that year, including painters and uh, architects and other more classically design-oriented uh, types of entry. But not only did it win the digital category, it won the overall category, not because it's the most beautiful looking thing you ever came across, but because its design is entirely appropriate and fit for purpose for what it is. So design and beauty and creativity come in lots of different forms. We hear that accessibility is difficult, it's hard, it's limiting, I don't understand it, I can't do it, I haven't got time. And actually, I have to confess, sure, this one's true. Accessibility can be difficult, but I'm going to let you into a secret. So there's a bunch of other stuff that you've learned how to do. When you were little, tying your shoelaces was really difficult. Learning to tie them so they stayed tied up and didn't trip you over when they came undone 10 minutes later, that was really hard. And it often came with bumps and cuts and bruises along the way to help you learn the lessons. But I'm pretty willing to bet that once you got the hang of it, even to this day, you're still tying shoelaces, probably without even thinking about it. Cooking a Sunday roast, if this is your thing. The first time you cook a Sunday roast, it feels like you are planning a military operation or a space shuttle drive. You've got to think about the weight of the meat and the cooking time. And does the cooking temperature match the cooking temperature you need for the potatoes to get them really crispy on the outside and fluffy on the middle? And what about the vegetables? Does cauliflower cook at the same rate as broccoli? And what if you roast the broccoli and steam the cauliflower? And then, oh, gravy. And wait, do we have to leave the meat to rest before we carve it? There's 106 things you need to think about seemingly all at once. But difficult it is when you first do it. By the time you've done it two or three times, it gets easier. And if you do it regularly, it becomes second nature. And before long, you can just throw a Sunday roast together without really thinking about it. Using technology. You may be old enough to remember starting to learn to use technology you know, in the day-to-day -day social sense of it uh, for the first time. I certainly am. And it wasn't easy. It confused me. I didn't really understand it at first. But it fascinated me and I enjoyed it and I got the hang of it and well, here I am doing it for a living now. If you're not old enough and you've been using technology all of your life, you're still in a profession that requires a lot of difficulty. You're designing complex systems and solutions. You're thinking about complex human interactions. You're designing things with color nuances and color meaning. You're getting into work on time every day. You're hitting deadlines. You're solving complex problems. In other words, all the way through your life, no matter who you are and what you do, you've done a bunch of difficult stuff already. So don't doubt for a minute that accessibility is something you can get the hang of too. It just takes a little bit of time, but I absolutely guarantee you, if you put that time into learning it, just like everything else, you'll soon get to the point where you don't even have to think about it anymore. And then, quite suddenly, it's not difficult at all. You can't hurry love. The Supremes from the 1960s, and they were absolutely right about accessibility too. So I'm pretty sure that's not what they were singing about, but you can't hurry it. You have to think about it all the way through the process. <clears throat> it means uh, it needs to be in the requirements for every project. If you're responsible for writing a project brief, make sure accessibility gets mentioned. If there are standards that you want met, get them documented in there too even if that's not part of your job. If you get given a project brief and it doesn't mention accessibility, then question that very politely, very gently, but very firmly. Ask, where is accessibility in this? Why are we not thinking about this in the project? It's important for usability. It's important for brand recognition, for a whole bunch of things that every product and feature should aim to achieve. So disrupt the status quo and push back a little bit if that's the case. Think about user research. Consider the ways people use technologies, particularly the people who don't use technologies the way you do, the ways you're familiar with. So for example, if you use personas, go back and dig your personas out and sprinkle some disabilities and accessibility needs into your existing personas. I caution against creating personas just to be the hook for a disability because that's not how humans work. You know, take me, for example, I identify as female, I have purple hair, I'm in my 40s, I'm a director of a company, and I'm blind. 
All of those things are true and accurate and an important part of my character. And personas should be the same. It's never disability first any more than it's hair color first. It's just a set of characteristics that make up well, a persona. So mix disability into your existing personas and use them as you design and develop. Think about design. So in one form, this can be thinking about people who see differently to the way you may see or perhaps don't see at all. For example, think about the topography you choose. Doing something as simple as choosing a font face that has very simple, clean lines, is very readable, and that has characters that are not easily confused with each other. So the A and the O, for example, are always really easy to tell apart. Doing this will make things easier to read for everybody, but particularly someone who has literacy difficulties or a reading disability like dyslexia, where letters can become blurry or hard to distinguish on the screen. <clears throat> Choose a good, comfortable text size for everybody to read. Uh, it's amazing how much tiny text we see in different interface design at the moment. And sure, you know, if you're young and fit and you've got 2020 vision, um, I applaud you, you're lucky, uh, you may be able to read very tiny text, but actually most people can't. And more importantly, most people don't want to have to make the effort to try squinting at something. So choose a generous default text size. If someone needs it to be larger again, then make sure that the design accommodates the ability for the content to be zoomed in or the text to be resized, whatever platform someone's using. So you've built in that flexibility for people to be able to make choices about it, but start off from a good, comfortable point of view. And think about color palettes. Whether you get to choose the color palette for the project that you're working on or you're working within an existing color palette, Give yourself as much flexibility as you can to create good contrast in your designs. Let text stand out easily from what it sits on in the background. The same with elements that are focusable, buttons, links, form fields. Make it very easy to see when one of those has got focus with the keyboard so people can distinguish what they're about to tap or click on. Uh, make things very visible, very clearly distinguishable, and you'll help an awful lot of people. Uh, people who maybe have a migraine and are struggling to see, uh, people who have low vision or perhaps color blindness, uh, or, you know, just, again, everybody. Ease is good. Think about layout. Create layouts that are simple, consistent, and uncluttered. This is one of the things that won the Gov.UK platform that Design of the Year Award. They recognize that people coming to interact with government are not there to enjoy themselves particularly. We're there to pay our driving licenses, our tax bills, to get a fishing license, to find out where we can travel in the world or what the COVID restrictions are. So keeping it trim, keeping it simple, keeping it easy and focused on what people want to get there and done. That's really good design. And it also builds familiarity. Let people get used to the way something looks and feels on your website or your interface and then stick with it so that people don't have to learn stuff every time they move around. And then think about interaction. Consider the people who interact with technologies in all those different ways I mentioned. For example, target size. If something needs to be clicked or tapped or hit with a key, make it nice and comfortably big. If someone has a condition like Parkinson's or motor neurone disease where they have tremors, they might find it difficult to get the coordination to tap on a very tiny area. You might just be a person who has large hands and fingers that don't fit neatly into tiny spaces on your touchscreen device. Uh, one of the few things that we can actually prove you know, in a scientific sense is the larger the target, the less time it takes for someone to acquire it as a target, as they say. In other words, the less time it takes for someone to find it, point it, click it, tap it, and do so accurately and successfully. Think about action buttons. Make sure that when you want someone to do something, submit a form, that there's a clear call to action, a button to do it. People with cognitive disabilities, particularly those with autistic spectrum disorder, can often struggle if there isn't a clear imperative to do something. So it's not uncommon to see search fields that don't have a search button. Uh, if you have a search button, that's a clear call to action. Hit this button, it will execute the search. That's really important 
for people with some cognitive disabilities. It's also helpful for people who use speech recognition because it's very easy to say click a button or click search button. It's a lot harder to know that when you're still focused in the search edit field, you've then got to simulate an enter key press or a mouse click there. So good usability all around with accessibility. Make space for labels and instructions, whether you're involved in content design or not. Uh, make sure there is space for labels that remain visible for form fields so people know what's expected of them with regard to the form field and that even if they get distracted that label remains there we often use placeholders in text boxes but the problem is they vanish when you start using an edit field you might have a short-term memory disability and as soon as you start typing in and you forget what it was that you were supposed to be doing that label's gone you might just get distracted because the kids have started trying to kill each other in the next door room and by the time you look back you've sort of you know forgotten what it was you were focused on so help people by making labels and instructions available and then in production uh, the end of the process uh, if you are involved in the development and implementation particularly for the web, think about using the right HTML elements for the job if you can. You know, HTML has a lot of good accessibility baked in. So if you use a table element, an assistive technology like a screen reader that I use will tell me that there's a table on screen. Same with headings, lists, links, paragraphs, pretty much every um, you know, typed HTML elements you can think of. And if you can't use those elements and you're using divs and spans as your building blocks, then use something like ARIA with extra JavaScript to make sure that the accessibility is polyfilled. It means a bit of extra work for you, of course, but you know that's the way it goes sometimes. But think about these things and the way assistive technologies like screen readers and speech recognition tools benefit from the quality of the code. And then think about usability testing. This, of course, actually is relevant all the way through the production lifecycle, but I've put it at the end here to, to capture that idea. Make sure you include people with disabilities and access needs, older people too, in your usability testing sessions. If it isn't clear already by listening to this talk, those people make up an enormous part of your audience. Forget all the official statistics that you'll read out there. They are a bare fraction of the reality of the situation. So make sure that you include people with disabilities in usability testing. So, The Things We Do For Love, a song from 10CC back in 1977. What are the things that we can do for love, or in this case, accessibility? Well, we can use the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines from the W3C, and you will come across those almost every time you hear anyone talk about accessibility. They are very useful, but they're also very focused on code and implementation. Not entirely, but much of the guidelines is, is about how we code and implement things. They also don't really cover on the idea of experience. And that's why I'd like to introduce you to the inclusive design principles. They are seven principles designed to elevate thinking about accessibility from a matter of technical conformance into the idea of truly inclusive experiences. I co-authored these with three uh, other excellent people uh, from the industry. Henny Swan, who incidentally is the person I have to thank for all the beautiful images throughout my presentation, Ian Pouncey and Hayden Pickering. And we put these together and I'd like to share with them you with them you with them now the first is provide comparable experience uh, this one says that make sure your interface provides a comparable experience so people can use your interface without undermining the quality of what they're trying to do or the content that you've given them so a good example is a text description accessibility in the technical conformance sense says that if you have an image you should provide a text description so someone who can't see the image is able to understand what it contains or what it's for. So we could, for this picture of the hole in the wall, give it a text description of um, the hole in the wall. Or we could be a little bit more expansive and say uh, a, a photograph of the South African landmark, the hole in the wall. But although that does the job, it doesn't really convey much experience. It doesn't really sell or convey what's in the image. 
But if we used a text description that said something like white waves crashing through a giant arched hole in a wall of rock with nervous looking swimmers cautiously looking on, which is exactly what's captured in the image, we get a much better sense of the experience. We, we trigger emotional responses. We get a sense of, oh, yes, how are those swimmers feeling? You know, when I want to be swimming there. And we get a sense of the majesty and the beauty of this famous landmark. And that's the idea of inclusive design and elevating it beyond accessibility. Next principle, consider situation. Uh, make sure that your interface delivers a valuable experience to people, no matter what situation they happen to find themselves in. So for example, here, color contrast. Picture of a person stretched out on a beach, presumably in the sunshine, using his mobile phone. I mentioned color contrast earlier with color design and the importance of being able to see text clearly against the background. If you're out, in the situation where there's bright sunshine on the beach and you're trying to use your device maybe to catch up on your, your social media updates, you want to be able to see what it is your friends and, and, and peers have been posting. So good color contrast is a way to help that happen for someone who maybe has a situational disability of being out in bright sunshine. Be consistent. Use familiar conventions and apply them consistently. <clears throat> Uh, it turns out that we humans do things for a reason quite often. Not always, but often. Uh, take the wheel, for example. There's a very good reason why the wheel looks pretty much like it has done for the past thousands of years. It's because it does what it needs to. It does it very well. It's good design. It's fit for purpose. We know how it works. We can reuse it. Houses are the same. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. The places where we live share common characteristics. There is some notion of walls or a roof to protect us from the elements. Often there is an idea of something you can look through to see the outside world. And certainly there is a way to get in and out of the dwelling. They might all look very different. In fact, ours is one good example of how design creativity you know, can be done within a consistent framework. But the point is, is that when we get used to patterns, we understand them, we know they work, we're familiar with them, and we could use them very easily without even thinking about it. So taking that to interface design makes a lot of sense. Reuse the patterns that people know buttons, links, form fields, tab panels, doesn't matter what they are, but don't make people learn how to use new and esoteric things just for the sake of it. Stick to familiarity. Give control. Uh, make sure people are in control, that they can choose to interact with content in the way that they would prefer to do it. Infinite scroll gives us a good example. If you are sighted and you use a mouse, you can use your scroll wheel to quickly skim through lots and lots of content. It's a really good way to control it. But if you're sighted and use a keyboard, it's maybe not so convenient because you have to tab through all the stuff inside the infinite scroll. And once you've got a certain way in, you're stuck with a choice. You've either got to shift tab all the way back out or keep tabbing ad infinitum until you hopefully get out the other side. And that's not a good experience. But if we let people take control of the content, perhaps by giving them the option to choose pagination over infinite scroll, we put people back in control and make the experience much more inclusive. We offer choice. Give people choices, ways to complete tasks, particularly the ones that are a little bit unusual or particularly complicated. And multiple ways is a good way to do this. The map on screen shows that there are different ways to get between Johannesburg and Cape Town. That's just by driving. We could actually walk, I suppose. I might not want to, but the point is there are different ways to get that A to B journey done and dusted. And it's the same with interface design. Apple does this remarkably well in its iOS um, email client. You can choose to delete one email at a time, which might be convenient if you only have one to delete, or you can go into edit delete mode and select multiple emails, tap, tap, tap to select each email, and then tap once more to delete them all. That's convenient if you want to bulk delete, but it's also more usable if you maybe have a dexterity difficulty that means all the swiping and gesturing of individual deletion would be more hard work than you'd want it to be. Prioritize content, helping people get the job done, focus on the task that they want to accomplish when they come to the thing that you are designing or building. So on screen is the 
uh, homepage of a mental health issues charity called Mine. And they have quite apparently decided or, or discovered through research that people come to their website for two reasons. One is that they want help because they have mental health concerns that they want to discuss. The other is that they want to donate. And those two user journeys are dealt with with really clear, high priority calls to action right at the top of the page. You can't escape them, whether you're looking at the page or not looking at it and listening to it with a screen reader, doesn't matter how, they're right there, front and center, and people are easily able to choose to prioritize the route they want to take. And then lastly, add value. Consider the ways that you can add value to the features that you're designing and building. And I think of this as do the hard work so that users don't have to. There are a whole bunch of different ways you could do this. Some of them probably quite creative, but a couple of examples. If you need people to fill in an address, perhaps for a takeaway delivery or such, give them the option to auto populate the form field based on the geolocation information that's available. It'll save people typing. Uh, it'll save you know, screen reader users on a touch screen. Typing is really laborious. If you've got typing difficulties anyway and you use speech recognition, it'll make that quicker. It just makes it more convenient, actually, for all of us. Similarly, if your interface pings notifications and makes a sound to, to warn people there's an incoming chat message or, or notification, consider using the platform vibration APIs to create a, a haptic sense of feedback when a notification comes in. So if you don't hear very well or at all, you get that notification too. So think about ways, and really, this is a good place to employ your creativity. Think about different things that you can do to make the experience easier for the people who will be using your interface. And so we come to the greatest love of all, Whitney Houston. In her song, she says, she finds the greatest love of all inside of me. And that's actually a terribly cheesy song, but it's a really good point. And that's the takeaway thought I'd like to leave you with. I really hope that after listening to this talk, you'll all go away and look around inside yourselves for the part of you that does what you do because you like feeling good. You like taking pride in the thing that you've built, designed, created, implemented, put together. You want to do the best that you can. You want to create something that's enjoyable, inclusive, that people will really have a good time using and a successful time using. And so just remember as you head back to work and you start doing what you do every day that there are a few things in life, and that includes accessibility, that can't be made better when they're not made with a little bit of love. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that absolutely awesome talk, Leone. Um, insightful, informative, absolutely awesome. I actually just want to read one of the comments from Le Johan Loksha. Um, and he says, it's just me, but I think Leone should consider doing BBC documentary voiceovers. She produces <laughs> her voice and communication extremely well. <laughs> and captivating. By the way, great content. Um, Thank you. And lots of positive com comments. Um, we've got three questions, so let's jump into it. The first question is by Daniela. Um, does the writing of content like text des descriptions for photographs typically fall within the domain of the designer, or would the developers create that content? Um, it depends whether you're talking about the reality or, or, or the ideal. I think the ideal is that it should be collaborative. Uh, and it should definitely you know, start with a collaboration between certainly the designer uh, and if, if there is a person in this role, the content designer for, for the product. Because uh, images, whether you look at them or, or listen to a description about them, they are part of design. It's just design in different terms. So if you put an image you know, on a page or in an interface because you want to provoke an emotional reaction, you want to, to convey a sense of you know, emotion or trigger certain thoughts, and, and that's a huge part of design, you want to make sure that the text description accomplishes the same thing. Um, I used to be able to see, so if I you know, hear a description of an image, I actually conjure up a very, to me at least, clear mental picture of what I think that image contains. So actually the, the emotive 
reaction is is very very similar uh, so i think it should start with the designer because it's the designer who really knows why that image is there what it's supposed to do what it's supposed to trigger uh, by the time you get to the developer uh, i think those those choices should be made developers have skills in implementation um, but i think it's it's utilizing you know different parts of the process in the best way possible thank you uh, thank you for that the only hope that answers the question Danilla. um the next question is by Sean Dunn. Uh, what is the best practice regarding accessibility when using horizontal scrolling on mobile app, specifically using the voiceover setting on your phone and how it should be described to the user? Uh, in theory, you shouldn't need to describe it to the user. If, if you find yourself at the point where you're thinking that might be a good thing to do, that's probably either time to to rethink the interaction itself uh coming back to that thing i was just talking about you know if we ask people to learn new things and, and step out of the unfamiliar uh you know it, it 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 gets more complicated but uh horizontal scrolling actually works quite well there are um built-in gestures with voiceover on ios that, that that enable you to do that so as long as you're sticking to sort of the reasonably conventional standard interactions um preferably ones that, that use components from, from the SDK, uh, you'll, you'll find that voiceover actually just adapts itself pretty well to that. And, and there are corresponding gestures that will let voiceover users do the same thing um, without having to get too complicated about it. Thank you. Thank you, Leonie. Um, and then we have another question also by Sean. Do you have any good links for access, accessibility guidelines on mobile apps? So, uh, Apple, uh, Apple's human interface guidelines have some very good, uh, very good guidelines around accessibility. Uh, in some cases, of course, they are a little bit iOS voiceover type centric, but actually 90% of them you, you could easily apply to, to Android or any other touchscreen device. So actually I would, I would look those up and, and, and start there because they cover, uh, actually a lot of the stuff I talked about today, you know, color design, interaction, different assistive technologies, uh, text size, topography, tons of stuff like that, uh, target size I mentioned earlier. So I'd start there, they're a pretty good resource. Yeah, so that was the that was the, the question. So if we've got that, I think the next question we have is Steve Barnett. And uh, hey, Steve, Steve's all the way from New Zealand. Uh, what's the best way for us to measure progress in improving the accessibility of our product? I think there are two two ways you can approach this. Uh, one is just to keep testing. Um, you know, keep a track of the issues you've got on your backlog that are uh, labeled for accessibility and, and, you know, keep seeing that number go down if you can. Uh, do get into the habit of, you know, some more formalized testing of your product. Uh, I mentioned the web content accessibility guidelines and they're often the benchmark you use to test it. So, uh, you know, reasonably regular tests, you know, that show improvement uh, on that's another way. The other thing you can do is, is if your team is, is still in the kind of learning and getting familiar with accessibility stages, then uh, get some training in and make sure that when you do, that training comes with a way to evaluate progress after it. It's really easy to go to a training course and come back, you know, re-energized and excited. And then three weeks later, you're just you know, running for a deadline and, and it's hard to put it into practice. But if you put in place an evaluation program afterwards, then, you know, after a month, after three months, after six months, you keep checking back in with the people who did the training to see how they're, they're feeling in terms of their accessibility knowledge. And, and that's another good progress marker to track. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, just the last question here from Steve. Uh, what have you found is the most successful way to help people to see the importance of building accessible products? The thing that's made people go, oh, damn, yep. <laughs> um, it really depends on the person you're talking to. Uh, there's a great page uh, from the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative that makes the business case for accessibility. And it's got some great quotes by um, 
people at Apple and at Google, who essentially talk about the astonishing amount of money that they've made by making accessibility a core design principle. So that's a good good thing to say if the person you're talking to, you know, is someone who's oriented towards budgeting and finance. Uh, if it's someone who you know you want to appeal to on more of the sort of the human angle, uh, get some usability testing done with people with disabilities. I guarantee you after three minutes of watching somebody really struggle to achieve a task with the product or service that they're responsible for and failing to do it, they'll start to rethink. You can also, uh, you know, take some steps towards empathy and challenge people to actually try something for themselves. Just tell them, ditch your mouse or your trackpad, use the tab key, now go and buy something from your favorite online store and see how easy it is or try something with, with the product you're responsible and see how you get on. Um, Empathy is tricky um, because if you don't have a permanent disability, of course, you can walk away from your condition and, and that changes the dynamics slightly. But you can come to understand what it's like and, and quite often just how bloody difficult it can be to do stuff. And, and that understanding can be, if you'll forgive the pun, something of an eye opener too. Okay. Leonie, uh, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge. Uh, much appreciated. I see Henny Swan just posted there uh, a reference about the business case, which I think is fantastic. Thanks, thank, you. thank you so much, Henny. <laughs> thank you very much. It was lovely. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And if anybody has any more questions, you can find me on Twitter. I'm just Leoni Watson. So please ping me over. My DMs are open. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day.